Welcome to McKinley Railway. This is Manchester Station. This is the second in our series about the stations in detail and today we're going to be talking about Manchester. Um, I think this is probably my most favourite station of all the, 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 the areas we have at McKinley. Um, it was the first station we built. David Marshall was helping me at that stage and it's the most complete. Like London, it's a terminus. So we have two large terminus stations on the railway, London and Manchester. The difference with Manchester is it's a more compressed space. The, the, uh, the aisles are narrower and in a way it's longer as well. And what we found is that with this incredibly complicated throat down the middle here, it's not for beginners. So this station looks beautiful, is challenging, it's for our more experienced operators to run and it's got all kinds of interesting facets which I'm going to take you through. If I can start at the other end with the station. Manchester is a four-track terminus station. It's an Alan Gibson roof that they built for Bath Green Park and David Marshall cleverly adapted it so that it spanned four tracks here at Manchester. The middle two tracks have got a Shinohara scissor crossing to allow us to run intensive short train commuter workings out of the middle two platforms of which we would then have the outer two primarily for regional and express trains. We haven't done that yet but there's always hope. In front of the station we have the two goods reception and goods departure tracks and then down here we have a fan of sidings with a relatively modest goods shed. And in hindsight, that's inappropriate for the scale of the location. But we'll come to that at the end of this uh, session. If I now go back down to the other end, we have the brewery at the rear of the layout. And it's beautiful with all the kegs and the um, unloading facilities, the tracks going underneath the road, the Victorian back-to-back -back houses along above the arches there the fantastic back scene created by Jenny Drake. Then we have Manchester's wonderful throat with the eight single and double slips that uh, uh, you just have to drive your engines over it with determination. The, the four track engine shed, the coaling tower, and then behind me here, we've got the turntable. So there's everything in this station. We forgot one thing though. We've got somewhere to put the carriages. So with a bit of inventive creativity, <laughs> we took the head shunt and all the way around the back here and in front of Port Arlington, we have three Manchester carriage sidings that got bolted onto the layout as a last minute idea, but it works well. So this station has pretty much everything you could ever want. In addition, the key component we have is a main line running in front of Manchester so that whilst you're busy moving wagons and parcel vans and things around the station, mainline trains are going about their business, going to places that you're not sure about, recreating that image I had as a boy in Bristol in the 1960s. From an operational perspective, Manchester is similar to London. We have our three different classes of passenger service, our locals, regional and express, four, six and eight car trains. We run those out of Manchester. The local trains run to Birmingham and other stations around Manchester. The regional trains come through Manchester. So they start at say places like Bristol, which are off layout, come through Manchester and then go on up to Glasgow and vice versa. So although it's a terminus station, trains are coming in and they're required to put a new locomotive on the front and take that engine straight back out as it carries on with its journey. And then you have the dedicated express trains, which go from here to London. Like, for example, in the early 1960s, the Blue Pullman started in Manchester and went to London and then came back at the end of the day. In addition, we run uh, a light touch freight service in the sense that we've got two freight tracks for arriving for arrivals and departures. 
We have trains arriving, but today we don't really put them to any purpose. And part, as you know, of the plan that we're going to with the extension, besides being a time machine, is to start putting freight into a more centre stage position with the operations of the railways. Right now, it's de definitely in the sort of second division, the lower second division. There's not any purpose given to freight movement, but that will change. And I intend to describe that now to give you an idea of what we found out about what we need to change in Manchester. But first, let me focus on the control panel. I've talked about the London one. Let me show you the Manchester one. So here is the control panel for Manchester. Obviously the track plan is different to the one in London, but fundamentally they operate in a similar way. The platform release panels are at the end there. We have all of the point controls on the layout and we have the interlocking mechanisms for the whole of the station and the now familiar red light, which indicates that interlocking is on between the computer and the rest of the layout. When the interlock is on and you don't have control of the station, that's when the three green lights are showing, any of the tracks that the computer wants to control or has the authority to control cannot be set by the, any of the operators in the station because the computer has control of those tracks. It doesn't though have control of things such as the engine shed. That can be changed at will as can the brewery, because the computer never drives trains into those areas. In order to control trains in the central area, you have to get the interlock, you have to. I've now got control of Manchester. And now I can set my path through that infamous throat that we have. The one important thing about Manchester is you have to follow the lights on the panel. Don't ever try and follow the path through the points. You'll never get it right. You'll always miss one because there's so many fine slivers of metal there, you never see it through. But the lights, if there's a nice clean line to whichever track you need to get to, they're the ones you should use. So that gives you an indication of the control panel. One of the things we've learned in our testing of all of our stations recently is that this panel needs to be changed. Besides the fact that it's old now, it's 15 years old, maybe 20 years old, and needs a facelift, we need to make it deeper and spread the tracks apart. We need to put reference points and the station on here, such as the signal gantries, the signal box, the coaling tower, the end of the wall, places that people would be identifying for where they're going to be moving to with their shunters. And in addition, what we also found as we were trying to run intensive freight services with two operators running shunters, was that with concurrent operations, the station manager got confused, especially if Bernie was running the green shunter on his right and Ian was running the steam shunter on his left. If those shunters changed position, the person's mind still said, Bernie is on the right and Ian's on the left, but actually their engines have moved. And so we decided to have very different coloured locomotives. And luckily for us, British Railways had green shunters, diesel shunters, at the time we started the time machine in 1956. And so we have different coloured shunters and the operators are known by their shunting colour. So I, as a station manager in this station, will be giving directions to the green shunter or the black shunter to avoid confusion. So now what I'd like to do is talk about the revised freight operation for Manchester. What we've been finding out and how it works, or what works best for us. Manchester, as it stands, has got three defined spots for freight operations. There's the brewery, it's clearly defined over there. Grain will arrive. Vans, empty vans will come in to take beer away. Um, there will be vans that take waste product away and things like this. We have the engine shed. And this is a surprisingly large amount of traffic that would go to an engine shed. Coal, later on oils, uh, lubricants, vans of parts, etc, etc. And then down there we have the, uh, the uh, goods shed. At this end we can see that it works quite well. But at that end, 
Even though it looks beautiful with this great fan of sidings, it doesn't really work. And let me show you why. This good shed is a small country good shed in reality, and we're in Manchester. So that was an interesting dilemma. There could be lots and lots of stuff wanting to come in. And as I've just mentioned, this great fan of, of track sidings that go off down here doesn't really allow you to do anything with your vans or your open wagons, etc. And so we considered, well, what would we do? And after about three or four weeks worth of effort, we come up with a plan. And what I'm going to do is put that new stuff in place. Just bear with me a minute and I'll go and get it. And voila, here's the revised station. The good shed is now going to extend to encompass two tracks and facilitate the third track here. In addition, we're going to have a loading ramp at this end so we can add an additional spot for vehicular access. And we're going to be putting one, two, three, four points in. What these four points do is it allows us to bring out, to have this track as being for goods unloading. When they come out, they can be put straight back in here for loading. Spares can be kept in here for when they did it. And once the wagons have been loaded and ready for departure, they can be rolled straight out onto the departure track, moved back in here. So this facilitates a much better flow of wagons and allows our operators to just keep moving trains around. The one additional thing that you will have heard us talking about in previous times was that we were going to be using RFID. The plan is that we will be putting these RFID sensors. This is the sensor, the aerial, and hopefully we can put it under the baseboard, under the track here and here and here and here and so on, so that we can capture when these wagons have come into the station. Because the problem with British wagons is they're all brown and on the whole they're fairly nondescript. They're all just vans. If you look at these three, there's no description, there's no visual differentiation between any of those vans really. And so with this under the baseboard, that will allow us to tag where or record where the vans have moved to. If this doesn't work, we're then going to have to lift up and cut open the track, cut off the ballast, embed this under the track and then relay the track, which is going to be messy. But our tests have shown us that we get about a 30 millimeter, so it's just over an inch range. This is about 18 mil, so it should work. So that gives you a brief idea of what we're trying to do with Manchester. The plan is that this will be done after London. I noticed in my video about London that I thought that would be done in about six months. We've changed what we're going to be doing in relation to the extension. So London will probably be at least, I think, a year away. And I think this will be three to four months after London. So we probably won't be making these changes for at least 15 to 18 months. But that shows the thinking and the planning that we're going into at this stage to try and get it right. So that sums up what we're doing at Manchester in about two years' time. So thank you for watching. Stay tuned. See you soon.